Welcome back, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that film. Uh, what a lot of food for thought today. I really, really appreciate all the work and thought that went into this, this expansive film, truly. I mean, it took so many years to pull together. Um, just to introduce myself once again, my name is Mara Welton. I'm the director of programming here at Slow Food USA, and I'm so glad that so many of you could join us today um, to watch The Ant and the Grasshopper. Um, we are joined now with our two guests, uh, Raj Patel and Hiile Hobart. I will, um, let me just introduce you really quickly and then we can get started with our conversation about this film. Uh, Hiile, I'll start with you. You're assistant professor of anthropology at UT Austin. She researches and writes on topics around indigenous foodways, Pacific Island studies, settler colonialism and the social performance of taste and her book, Cooling the Tropics, Ice Indigeneity and Hawaiian Refreshment is forthcoming from Duke University Press sometime next year. And Raj Patel, uh, we're so glad to have you here with us today. Um, you're an award-winning author, filmmaker and academic. Uh, Raj is a research professor in the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin. Uh, Raj has degrees from the University of Oxford, the London School of Economics and Cornell University. He's worked for the World Bank and the WTO and protested against them around the world. And in 2016, he was recognized with the James Beard Foundation Leadership Award. And he's testified about the causes of the global food crisis um, to the US, the UK and EU governments and is a member of the International Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems. Uh, Raj's first book was Stuffed and Starved. Uh, I'm sure many of you have read this one, The Hidden Battle for the World Food System. And his second book, The Value of Nothing, was a New York Times and international bestseller. He's the co-author. Oh, all of this, Mara. This I, know, I know, I no, know. No, no, no. We have, we have. <laughs> I, I want people to know where to see you and hear from you and um, where to find you. Um, but we know you now through this uh, amazing work that you did for us. Thank you. So, um, so we have some questions that have been coming in on the on the uh, chat, but I would love to give you both a, an opportunity to now watching it again after um, probably some time, if you have some initial thoughts and uh, reactions before we jump into some questions. Thank you for being here. Thank um, you, Mara. Oh. No, no, please. Please go. Oh, Raj, I think we'll both be too polite here, but um, I do want to start by saying how um, absolutely chuffed I am to be invited to be in conversation with you. I've been reading your work since I was an undergraduate student, and so to now be your colleague at UT Austin feels like a really um, profound pleasure and delight. Um, this is just such an incredible film. It has so many complex layers to it. Um, I have a million questions for you. I will let you get a word in edgewise, um, but once you do, I would love to start us off with a couple of um, questions that I'm really curious about. That sounds great. Um, I have to say, Hile, I'm so uh, I'm so grateful that uh, we're in conversation. It's just wonderful to uh, just to, to be uh, uh, to bask in your glory. And oh my gosh, to, yours! Uh, I mean, the, the, for folk who don't know, Hile's uh, work is incredible, and um, her book is going to be incredibly important when it when it comes out. Um, get it? Uh, but it, I mean, you know, just looking at the film. Um, you know, I mean, the, the the line "it would take a global emergency to bring us all together." I think is one that sort of resonates. Um, uh, in its, you know, it, I mean, th there's always this politics, isn't there, uh, hanging around in the background that, you know, we just have to wait for things to get really crap. And then magically, somehow we will come together. Uh, and that magic hasn't happened because it's magical thinking to imagine it will. Um, so uh, I, I think, you, you know, I'm just, just sort of having a chance to, to reflect on that, it, particularly in this moment with COP26 happening and, you know, this film will be screening at COP um, later on this week. Um, but it's, you know, the, the you know, the, the catastrophe is us and we, you know, the, the, there are ways in which we might you know, remedy it and meet it, uh, it, it feels like, but um, not through the, the, the kind of heroic Hollywood narratives in which, you know, all, all it takes is, uh, you know, uh, uh, some white saviors to bring us all together and everything's going to be fine. That's, that's, that's not the way this ends. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think it's really interesting whenever I hear that sentiment, it's going to take this big crisis for us to spring into action. Yet we know that the crisis has been happening for a really long time, right? This imagined crisis that's going to happen has occurred in the past and to not recognize it as such, I think um, speaks to an enormous blind spot um, with uh, those who are in the most powerful positions to affect change. There are so many complicated characters uh, that you bring to the table in um, this film. And some of the main themes that I really paid attention to that were simmering under the surface um, is this overlap of um, gender, race, and religiosity and religion. Um, and so I would really love to hear a little bit more about how you paid attention to or tracked these discourses about faith that run through the film because so often they uh, religion becomes used as a rationale for action, but also in a lot of key points, a rationale for profound inaction. Um, so I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you tracked that as a filmmaker. Um, well, I mean, it, uh, th thanks for, for that wonderful question. I mean, the, the I, I'm the least godly person I know. Uh, and so it was, in, it was really surprising that this was a, a big theme in the film for me because I didn't set out to make that kind of a film. I mean, I, I certainly, I mean, the, the gender component was always going to be there. That was the reason we visited. I mean, I, I've been working with Soil, Food and Healthy Communities um, for, 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 for more than a decade. Uh, and we've been filming since 2010. Um, but the, uh, you know, what, what was clear, the reason we were there is because um, yeah, you know, a, a lot of the the films that you've seen around you know food and uh, you know the, the problems of the food system always have this kind of tenor, and this is you know it, it, they they cater to slow food audience members uh, in so far as you know it starts off with lots of suffering, and then you'll have a, a you know me or Vandana Shiva or Carlo Petrini or whoever it is going you know, you know what we need is good you know clean fair food, and uh, and then. By magic, we sort of shift cadence into um, farmers' markets and white people eating kale. And you know, we're told, look, if only we eat organic, everything's going to be fine. And so the reason that the gender component was there was because, look, here's here's a, a a group of people who have tackled patriarchy with some success, as you see throughout the film. And uh, now is the time not for sort of small incremental change and in shopping at the farmers' market, though. You know, I do that, and it's a good thing. But it, you know, the, the reason for gender was you know, gender to be such a central story. So you, you can do big things patriarchy yeah i mean i'll be flaying it out of myself until i die but uh, yeah as will winston uh, but that's a thing you can do and uh, so you know th th that was the reason that that you know this was a, a really central part of the story and why we spent so long tracking winston uh and there's there's so much footage of winston's transformation um that uh, that actually is now being used for training with the soil food and healthy communities project but the religion the religion angle was yeah, I'm still wrestling with it. I'm still learning about it. I, I was uh, at a, a, a conference of uh, evangelicals um, a couple of weeks ago, and you know, the, 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 it's a live debate there about whether um, some of the you know the evangelical community use God in order to you know scalp people uh, and to be able to justify an action in the same way as uh, you know progressive evangelicals use God to talk about our duties of care for uh, you know for, for the planet. I mean, you know what. I mean, Anita turned out to be a theologian. Uh, I didn't know that, um, and not just a theologian, but a prophet as well. And those cadences, those kind, you know, the, her language of speaking about how change is possible is not something I'd heard before. And I, you know, I, I, you know as uh, as an activist, as a comrade, as a as a scholar, I, I was trying to, you know, I mean, I had to develop an ear for it. Uh, and I was very glad that she schooled me in. Uh, in her ways of thinking about how change might work, and you know, her debates around uh, around climate change are for her theological debates uh, when she comes to the United States. Yeah, thank you for that, Raj. Um, and I think it's really fascinating that it was an element of the film that maybe you weren't seeking out, but that really came to the foreground because of the ways that um, a lot of times communities that are deeply religious are also deeply patriarchal. And we see that in um, one of the farming families that you go to visit, right? That the, they have this kind of perspective that um, a personal individual action is not necessary because um, whatever God wills will be, right? Mm -hmm. And so it becomes in a way of this rationale for inaction that I find really, um, Fascinating. 
One of the other things that I was, oh, please go ahead. No, no, no. I mean, it was just, it's interesting also that there's an emotional cadence to that, which, I mean, so there, there are two things going on with that family. One is, you know, Ed uh, is working at a coal fired, fired power station in part because he needs health care. Uh, and his son has a heart defect that comes, they think, from the, the technologies of industrial agriculture. So here's the situation where you've got a son with a heart problem uh, mm -hmm. and you need medical care, but we live in a society that doesn't provide that. And so the only way to get it is by working at a decent paying job that provides benefits. And so he works at a coal fired power station. Uh, and th there's, there's a sort of mode there of thinking about organic as a technology of care of the self, right? O organic mm -hmm. is just about keeping your body pure as opposed to uh, thinking about the web of life and how one sits in it. But then the the, the other side of this is, you know, it was, it was interesting to see um, the Jackson family's response to Anita and Esther, which was one of pity. Uh, and pity is is the the enemy of change in a way that that um, you know the, the, the denial is not. Like the denial, you've got traction, you can get somewhere. But pity kind of closes down the conversation. And I, I think that that. You know, th th those different kind of emotional cadences sit alongside the different kinds of approaches to theology and one's ability to wrestle with, um, you know, divine texts. Right. I'm sorry. No, no, that that's really wonderful. Um, we had a question come into the chat that I would love to build off of um, that was asked by Rachel Libman, um, which was, how did you select the farmers or the interlocutors um, that Anita and her crew would meet as they traveled to the United States. I was thinking about that too, because, and, and I think that this is a testament to um, your very keen sense of storytelling, is that, you know, the first three or so farming families that she comes, um, that she encounters are overwhelmingly white. Right, you can tell that these are folks that have very little um, racial consciousness, um, that are mostly affluent, that are maybe focused a little bit more um, on their local communities than the global context in which they live. Um, and so for the first half of the film, I was like, okay, is the other shoe going to drop? Are they going to meet with other black folks? Where are the black farmers in this story? And then the film pivots, right? And you kind of get this, attention that's being paid to increase racial consciousness uh, around food, farming, land use, private property ownership, who's doing labor, um, you know, who's a farmer, who's a farm worker, all of those kinds of really important um, uh, questions. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you chose the interlocutors and how you decided to place them in the arc of the film. Um. That, that that's tough. I mean, we, we um, you know, ideally what we'd wanted was to honor Anita's uh, request to come to America and persuade us all. Uh, and, uh, you know, so we, we tried uh, talking to the USDA and, you know, EPA, you know, every, everyone in government. And the only place place we got was um, Senator Jeff Merkley's office to, you know, to, to, to call us back. Um, and uh, then we were like, oh, well, maybe we can talk to, um, you know, large scale farmers, maybe we can talk to Monsanto, maybe we can talk to Pepsi, they, you know, we spent a lot of time trying to court these uh, organizations, they said no. Um, we went to Seattle, uh, in part, so that we could talk to, um, you know, uh, Valerie Segrest, at the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty uh, Project there. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, she, she makes a cameo in the film that there's, um, you know, basically the interaction uh, was so jet lagged that it th th there wasn't there wasn't any spark to the conversation, and so uh, in in the end we couldn't use it all. I mean, we we only used a sliver of it where you see Anita uh, turning her nose up at the idea of clam chowder. Oh, and host uh, holding hysterically that gooey duck. I noticed. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> they are impressive creatures. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you know, we, we tried to talk to the Gates Foundation. They wouldn't talk to us either. So you know, I mean, you you would there were lots of people who wouldn't um, wouldn't really bend to Anita's theory of change, which is you know, if you go to someone's door with your problem, they cannot ignore you, and that's right, which is why they ignored her. Uh, they wouldn't let her near the door. Uh, so in the end, the the folk we ended up talking to were friends uh, and and comrades and, uh, and and friends of friends. So. Um, you know, the, the uh, uh, Jim and Rebecca uh, Goodman are, you know, I, I mean, I've known them for decades and, and they're, they're um, but they, even they didn't know that their employees were, you know, climate skeptics. Uh, and uh, though, you know, I mean, I, I think that they, they, 
they suspected uh, that, um, that, uh, that you know that they may, may you know, their employees may have held uh, views contrary to theirs. But um, it, you know it took our coming there to to sort of elicit that. But so you know the. the the, the folk we met were buddies and comrades and friends of friends. Uh, and then we, we juggled the, some of the, the timeline around a little bit uh, because we wanted to, uh, you know, to, to really get that arc of tension of you know, what was at stake. And so, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm glad that you, um, you know, that, that it worked for you, that, that you know, the, the first couple of, uh, of, of encounters were precisely around, um, you know, just trying to get to see if there were peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer connections that might form in the Midwest. Um, but then, yeah, I mean, the, the actual journey involved starting in DC, then moving across uh, the country and then coming back uh to new york where we also filmed we didn't we didn't have a a way of squeezing in some of the stuff we did in food banks and uh in sort of fancy farm to table uh restaurants and things but um you know the the, the arc of it was really just just to sort of try and build some of the tension around uh people not getting it and then people getting it and then still not getting it and uh, i think that you know it, the, the, those cadences back those back and forths um needed to work in this way we i mean we, we tried juggling it around i mean it took 10 months of editing just to sort of get the pieces right but I, I think we managed to get the tension more or less correct this time around mm -hmm. that's wonderful um let's see oh I wanted to ask you about kind of the political climate as it changed across the 10 years that you were doing this project, right? Um, we had changes in presidency, we had changes in national policies towards climate change, international policies towards climate change. Um, the racial politics of the US has shifted drastically since you began filming. How did you attend to those shifts um, over the course of this project? Um, I mean, luckily, I, I had some grown-up filmmakers uh, by my side uh, because, you know, I mean, what, one of the ways that, I mean, I, I was like, this film needs to be finished now and it needs to be done. And this was, you know, in 2010. Uh, it's like, we, you know, the, the, we desperately need a film about climate change and we need, you know, it needs to be about this and that. And, um, and uh, the, the film took as long as it needed to for, to be able mm -hmm. to sort of achieve this arc. And one of the things that I was keen on was, you know, the, 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 you saw a little bit of... Um, Anita at outside the White House uh, at a, 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 a an anti-Trump protest, uh, and there was lots of quite funny and very engaging footage from there. Uh, and I, you know, the, my co-director Zach said, "Look, it's not going to work uh, if we, you know, I mean, it's it's too easy. Uh, it's too easy to just to, to date the film, but also to declare a kind of political preference." Uh, because the purpose of the film was to, you know, for, for this to be Anita's journey and not for it to be me um, going all David Attenborough saying, and here are the Malawians in front of the White House and they, they're, they, you know, they're blown away by the, you know, the, 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 the outrage against Donald Trump. You know, th th that would have, th that would have made it a different film. And it, I mean, and I think that that's, that's also why the film looks the way that it does is because it reflects Anita's far, you know, long durée ideas around what matters. Um, so you know, Anita made some choices about what's in the film and what isn't, and uh, she insisted, for instance, that the marriage abduction scene be there. Um, and you know, this was a sort of weird moment of us recognizing our sort of patriarchy and colonial privilege, where uh, Zach and I sat, you know, sat down with Anita and we recorded all of this, and then we sat down again and we talked about it some more. And you know, on three or four different occasions, we, we said to her, "Look, do you want this to be in the film? Uh, because you know, this is very sensitive, and it's you know, it, are, you, are, you, are you quite sure?" And you know, in the end, she was she was essentially saying, "Look, how many times do I have to tell you? Yes, I want it in the film because it, you know, if if it's not in the film, then people won't know that, that this can be overcome." Uh, and so, you know, th those kinds of priorities and those, you know, that kind of arc was absolutely central to to Anita, and that's why the film also has the kind of cadences that it does, and um, the, the the sort of politics that it does. It's not sort of um, bleeding from the eyes communism. It's not, um, uh, you know, a, a particularly kind of militant left left wingery here, um, and that's because it that that's what Anita wanted. Yeah, I think that, um, you know, it could have been so easy in the hands of a different filmmaker to show Anita being wide eyed rather than clear eyed. Mm -hmm. um, and that comes through really powerfully in the film. Mara, I, yeah, I would love I, to give an invitation to you sure, to jump you. in. No, this is fascinating. I love the conversation. Um, I was so blown away by how crystal clear Anita was 
and was able to just clearly identify the challenges that she was facing at home being so directly linked to climate change and just saying, I need to go talk to some other people about this and what is their experience and coming right to our doorstep and you know, addressing Americans and being confronted with our, by and large, a lack of concern for climate change. And I'm just wondering how, how did she contend with that? Um, that feeling or that sense of just being like, wow, even even farmers, my counterparts, you know, especially specifically these the white farmers that you engaged with early on in the film, were really feeling like climate change wasn't their concern. And I'm just curious if she had other um, other other thoughts around how that. Um, I, I mean, it didn't really stop her from, you know, going going to confront other people as well. Like she didn't get. Um, dejected by it, I guess. I'm impressed that she was able to see that connection and then coming to America, Americans don't even see the connection. And it, 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 it made me think too about how, how separate from nature I would think Americans feel um, mm. and maybe they don't see it as quite as urgent. I mean, to, to be fair, I mean, you know, Denise O'Brien, I think uh, Gil Gillespie has, has made the point that, that, um, oh, yeah. you know, that, that you, I mean, Denise O'Brien is, is someone who does get climate change and, and, and to, you know, so do um, uh, the Goodman family, Jim and Rebecca get it in a way that is, uh, you know, uh, the, the employees maybe don't or didn't at that time. Um, uh, as did, you know, uh, Malik Yakini and the folk at D Town Farms and the folk on Black Dirt Farm Collective. And I mean, it, it's not, it's not like, folk in America don't get it, but I, I don't think we're getting it urgently enough. And I think that that's, you know, the, the way that Anita um, feels about the United States now, uh, she was telling me was, was essentially, you know, like, I mean, America's like Winston, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at some point we need to realize we're in the same village as everyone else and we need to behave accordingly. Um, and uh, so while she was, heartened by the fact that the you know the, some of the folks she met were uh understanding climate change and were doing things particularly she, she you know engaging with detroit um you know that that was a an experience that she was uh excited about um and you know felt like you know these folks really not only get it but are doing stuff around this in a way that both models what life might be like under a proper um you know food policy and uh food bill in the united states but also um you know understood how patriarchy and race all kind of intersect and you know his colonialism all, all come together here um but uh, you know, i mean she also understands that for you know, as jocelyn uh says in uh oakland um most americans are insulated in one way or another for from uh, understanding climate change either yeah. by uh comfort or by uh you know ignorance um at the ignorance that, that's peddled around climate change uh and state cultivated ignorance and, and media propagated ignorance is incredibly dangerous here and she understands that in a way that, that just makes us sad for us um mm -hmm. but it's not like she's giving up uh and i think that's the other the other thing like you know with winston it's just a case of you, you do it every day and all of a sudden winston changes uh mm -hmm. and that you know that has to be the story with us too yeah clearly I, at one point, she says the truth moves slowly, but lies spread fast in America. And it made me think about these campaigns of disinformation and misinformation that happen here um, from big oil and big ag. And I was curious if in your time in Malawi, if you were noticing similar types of campaigns of misinformation there that she might be experiencing back home. Um, I mean, th th there's the long campaign of misinformation that comes from sort of colonialism and then from, uh, you know, industrial agriculture afterwards. So, uh, you know, one of the, uh, the, the visions for Malawi was that it should be a place that, first of all, provided, um, uh, you know, tropical products to uh, the United Kingdom when it was part of the British Empire. Uh, and now under World Bank loans, uh, Malawi is being told, yes, you've, you've got to export your corn and your sugar and your coffee and your tea and, you know, again, more tropical products uh, in order to pay off this illegitimate debt. Uh, and part of that technological package means that fertilizer and pesticides are, um, you know, being uh, disseminated fairly widely. Uh, the misinformation then is that this is the only way to do agriculture. And part of what you see in the fields in Malawi is uh, uh, you know, an embrace of 
polyculture of um, of citizens uh, you know, and these you know the, 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 usually women scientists uh, exchanging ideas with one another and the idea that folk can become scientists is uh, seditious and dangerous to the state but it is precisely the antidote to misinformation that, that, that we can peer review one another's work and we can call, you know, we can learn from one another. And that process of, of becoming scientists, not just about the soil, but then about one another and about patriarchy is um, the, you know, again, the, the, the response of the disinformation that, that uh, progress can only happen this way. And, that, you know, the only way to uh, empower women is by giving individual land title as opposed to, you know, directly con confronting patriarchy, for instance. Thank you for that. It's great. Um, Hiile, I would like to ask you if you have any other questions for right now, and then we'll go to some audience questions. Oh, well, um, I was I was thinking we probably didn't quite have time for one more question from me, but I did want to note how delighted I was to see Raj at the beginning of the film, The Three Sisters making an appearance. Yeah. Um, and that was just a really beautiful moment to think about ways of tethering what's going on in Malawi to the US that stands a little bit outside of um, dominant white American um, approaches to agriculture, right? That we have to remember that the US is not a monolith. It has not always been the way that it is. And it itself is a product of a very violent history of land dispossession um, and racial capitalism. Uh, so that was a really nice kind of subtle tethering that you did there that I really loved. I also appreciated that. It's very nice. Thank Great. You. Well, let's see. I have a couple questions here that I would like to try to get in while we're together. Um, Nico from Italy says, how did this trip making and making of this documentary impact the life of the protagonist in her community? How did it affect Anita and her family and her community? Um, I mean, so... so we didn't um, in the documentary filmmaking process. Uh, we, we tried to be, you know, as fairly as, as unobtrusive as we could uh, in in the first instance. But then, of course, when, when Anita said, "Look, yeah, do you want me to come to America?" We made that happen, and so that that was the sort of impact there. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know, materially, uh, we we sort of stood in the background uh, until we came to you know finishing the film up and uh, you know for example th th that final um, the, the musical interlude that was cut short in the credits um, that was something where all of a sudden we could pay for that uh, and so uh, we paid commercial rates for for, for that music um, which enabled everyone in the in the choir to be able to survive the year of covid uh, because you know, you know the, the, it, that was the right thing to do um, and you know, it, journalistically, we could do it because we weren't, uh, you know, asking anyone's opinion. We were merely paying for uh, for the creative work that they they had uh, that they had done there, um, and it was a way of supporting, uh, you know, supporting that community. I mean, we we recorded that I think a, the week before lockdown in Malawi, and then you know, we came back, and both Zach and I fell horribly ill, but there weren't tests at the time. But uh, it, it, you know, we 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 suspect that we we were. Uh, knocked by the virus because we were um, yeah, we, we, we got hot, uh, huddled over a um, a buffet in uh, in, in uh, Ethiopia with one of the last planes to come out of China and everyone was just wow. sort of spilling out there. So you know it was it, 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 lockdown hit hard in Malawi because uh, you know, I mean everyone was everyone's very compliant in terms of wearing masks and social distancing. You don't see the kind of culture wars there around that. But what you also have, unfortunately, is, is an economy that's dependent on remittances, on people sending money from work abroad. And when the global economy shut down, Malawi was throttled, uh, and so you know basically the economy ground to a halt. We were able to make a difference there. Um, but beyond that, you know, uh, the the this film is just starting to circulate. Um, so you know, I, I'm not sure what uh, the impacts are going to be, but watch this space a year from now, and hopefully we'll be able to um, share more about that because we're definitely continuing to work with um, you know with the Soils, Food, and Healthy Communities Initiative, and uh, I'm yeah I'm I'm as I, as I say I mean I'll be working with them uh, for the rest of my life, but I'm I'm not sure right now what what the the material impact has been. Um, beyond that, you know, the, the, our ability to be able to, to pay folk for the music. Great. Yeah, I'm hoping that the movie gets shown far and wide, for sure. Oh, and by the way, uh, I, I did see in, uh, in the questions of folk wondering how to get a hold of the film. Uh, if you're interested, um, I'll just stick a link to the website and uh, there's more, uh, you know, just 
click on that and, and um, the, 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 there are lots of screening options for y'all. Excellent. Thank you for that, Raj. Let's see, let's do one more question. Um, Shirley says and asks, I find it frustrating that climate change is political. Climate change is not a belief system. And how can we advance beyond the politicization of climate change, if at all? It's a great question. I don't think you can. Uh, I mean, I, I think that, but that's because I think everything's political. I mean, everything is political. It's just a case of whether whether it gets acknowledged in certain ways or not. Um, but again, I mean, everything's about sort of relationships of power in one way or another. Uh, and uh, so I, I would embrace it. I mean, I, I think that, you know, what, what's Anita doing when she's trying to persuade folks? She, she's not uh, using the language of people in suits from the coasts. Um, she's using a different kind of language, but she's still talking about power and responsibility. Uh, mm -hmm. And what is that if not politics? Uh, so, uh, I mean, I, 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 I get that there's a general distaste of politicians uh, and of, you know, particularly in the United States, uh, you know, Coke or Pepsi style politics, where, you know, you, either way, you're, you're, you're not going to get something magic. Uh, but there is, on the other hand, uh, a kind of readiness to engage around climate change from, particularly from young people these days, uh, who, where there is, uh, you know, I mean, this is the planet we live on, there's, there's a, a real uh, sense of emergency, and there's a real sense that actually engaging in the political process is a requirement to be able to uh, have a, a world worth living in. So I, I, I you know, I, I, I hate it that there is a culture war around this, but I don't think you can retreat from it. Um, I, I don't think that, that the way to win this culture war is to pretend it's not there uh, or to, to wish for a different set, you know, uh, wish for it to be held on, on different terrain. I mean, this is where the right and where the fossil fuel industry and where big ag is fighting their fight. Um, and it, it, they have to lose. Uh, you know, the, the, and, and they, they understand what's at stake. I mean, it's, it's, it's the future of their business model, it's the future of their profits, uh, and they would rather hang on to those. Um, and they're legally required to hang, you know, to, to fight as hard as they can for their shareholders. Um, so, of course, they're going to fight this war. Um, and as I say, you know, either they win and, or, or the planet does, but you can't have both. Well, and Anita said it herself when she was asked by that young farmer, Jordan, I think his name was at the Goodman's farm. He just says, well, what can we do over here to help you over there? And she just says, tell people that climate change is real. Become an advocate. Become an and activist for climate change. And become an yeah. activist, exactly. Thank you. Well, my goodness, we had, Hile, do you have oh, another question? Yeah, it, I, jumping off of what you were just noting there, Mara, and something that I found really interesting and in attention of the film was the way that um, the people, many of the people that Anita met turned to her and said, oh, well, what, what recommendations do you have for us to do? And I just thought it was so profound, right? These communities that overwhelmingly share a uh, shoulder the burden of climate change in the moment and then are asked to also provide the potential mm -hmm. solutions, right? That this idea mm -hmm. of like, well, I guess, you know, I don't really have any ideas of my own, but maybe Anita, you could provide some guidance to me. And I just thought, you know, that's such a moment, like a recurring moment that um, I'm really glad the film returned to and lingered on. So Raj, I would love to hear any thoughts that come to mind for you. No, I, I, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's it's not Anita's job. And yet, you know, she's doing it. I mean, in the same way, again, the Winston as person and as metaphor, right? It, it, <laughs> um, it, it's, it shouldn't be her job to convince him or me or anyone of our patriarchy, uh, but she does it because it's it's you know she's that she is that person, mm -hmm. uh, and she does it to, to to fight. She does it to survive. Uh, and uh, but but you know at some level, become activists for climate change is uh, is exactly what what we need to be doing. Uh, and you know it, it's I don't think it's fair then to say well what do you mean by that. Um, because that's that's so not her job, um, uh, and uh, I, I think that that's that's the sort of gauntlet that's being laid down for us is to to actually understand what we need is a red, black, and green new deal. Um, that you know, how, how do we make that happen? Mm -hmm. What what are the, the the ways in which we need to transform everything uh, about how we eat and you know cook food and prepare it uh, as uh, as, Tr as Trisha says because. Um, you know that that's our work we need to engage in a world of care and repair and reparation uh being part of repair right uh, and that's 
that's our work. That's that's what we have to do. Um, and uh, and I think that that uh, you know Anita just just saying look, this is this is it. Don't ask me to tell you what policies it is, but this is your work. Is I, I think sufficient. I mean, she's done enough. Yes. Yeah. I I wrote down um, Anita's words that I thought were just so profound and wonderful when she says, "After planting seeds, you need to water and weed." Mm -hmm. It's like I'm gonna type that out and stick it up next to my desk <laughs> it's part of being a caregiver right which is what you said that's what we're here to do we are here to be caregivers and that's the watering that's the weeding it's doing the work yes and always and often so overwhelmingly gendered exactly but as winston proved <laughs> change can oh, happen bless know. winston <laughs> <laughs> so interesting um Let's do one last um, question here because it's so uh, timely. Um, Nico asks, how is what we see in this documentary related to what is happening right now at the COP26? Um, great question. And what's happening right now is, uh, again, <laughs> the, the, the folk who don't want uh, these problems brought to their door haven't turned up. So, you know, R Russia and China aren't there. Uh, and the, you know the US is still recalcitrant. Um, there's not really much in the way of, for example, reparations, uh, or even you know, you know reparations. Obviously, that that, that, that we'll be fighting for that for a little while yet. But um, you know, even sort of basic things like uh, debt cancellation. Um, you know, I mean, it's it's all well and good to uh, you know to imagine carbon sequestration happening through whiz bang technologies and tech bros um, offering new kind of monetized solutions for locking carbon away. Uh, but it, you know, it, that, that's no good if countries in the global south next year have to slash burn and you know, rip things out of the soil uh, in order to pay off illegitimate debt. So you know, the, the, there's the, the big picture uh, remains elusive. And you know, the, the ideas of colonial debt and the, the ideas of um, you know, the, the sort of long accumulated sins in the soil doesn't appear anywhere in, uh, in COP26. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, and I, I, I think part of what COP26 is, I mean, the reason I'm going and the reason this film is going to be there is not to change policy for this COP, because that's all been set in stone. Um, we, we mobilize there to, to exchange ideas in the same way that, you know, Anita learned from, uh, from Detroit and vice versa. Um, and in fact, just a, a quick note, the, one, of the, one of the things I'm most proud of with this film is we um, uh, fundraised to not only just com complete the film, but also to have a spin-off film made by folk in Detroit, entirely directed and run by them. We just raised the money. Um, and uh, also they developed a legal toolkit so that other communities who find themselves the victims of um, documentary making smash and grabs where, you know, filmmakers come in as like, you've got a great story, we're going to tell it, bye. Um, th they, they can legally protect themselves. Um, so in, in the same way that sort of Terra Madre provides uh, uh, ideas about terroir and origin and, uh, you know, ways for communities to protect their, um, their food and their terroir. Um, we're trying to do the same by developing this legal toolkit, and that'll be out next year as well. So long story, but, but basically, you know, the idea of exchange is something that, that really matters. Uh, and I think what happened in the film in its best moments was that Anita and Esther were able to, to pick up ideas from, uh, from folk and bring them home with them. Uh, and outside COP, uh, on the streets at the People's Summit this weekend. I'm hoping that the same thing will happen. Wonderful. Well, I thank you. I thank you for bringing this to life and bringing it to our attention and giving us so much to think about and so much to talk about and um, become activists ourselves in Anita's footsteps. So thank you so much. And thank you, Hile. Your questions were perfect and very insightful. I appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, of course. And thank, thank you, you everyone for joining us today and spending some time um, watching this film and engaging in the Q&A. We really appreciate it a lot. Um, this production is a Slow Food um, USA production um, created in our Slow Food Live um, library, which can be accessed. And we'll put a link there in the, in the chat. There's a nice archive of Slow Food Live um, conversations just like this one and classes and skill shares that we developed through the pandemic so that we could bring slow food into your homes, uh, even when we couldn't gather and be together around tables and eating and um, being convivial with each other. So this was not another way to do it. And those are all archived for your, your pleasure. Um, please definitely look at Slow Food Live uh, link in our chat to go check those out. 
And um, I think that is everything for today. I hope everyone has a wonderful day. Enjoy your November and keep abreast of all of the climate change news to be coming, coming through this pipeline. Take care. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Bye-bye. Have a great day. Bye.